to the art scene. I'm your host, Lyle the Snow. There are some new shows I want to talk about. One uh, is at the Hirschhorn. They are, uh, they are a collectors of Duchamp in D.C., which is unusual because he didn't have a big body of work. But uh, Aaron and Barbara Levine uh, have given their collection to the Hirschhorn. Uh, it's, it's 50 works, which actually for Duchamp is amazing. <laughs> he, he spent the last part of his life uh, playing chess, but he really is important. In fact, I just read a book about Leonardo, Leonardo's brain, and I was amazed because Leonardo had an enormous body of work and he did science experiments. And the author actually compares him to Duchamp because Duchamp had so many unusual, he was an idea man, an intellect. So it wasn't actual work, it was his ideas. And I also was surprised to hear that George Orwell, who wrote 1984, was, was being compared to Nobel laureates in literature because when he came up with Double Speak and Big Brother is Watching You at Animal Farm, which has become so relevant, uh, it, it became clear that he was equal to the greatest writers because of being so with it about what the world is going to become. So back to Duchamp, he has, uh, he's most famous for what he called ready-mades or sort of found objects. He wanted us to see everyday objects as works of art. Just look at them for their shape. Naturally, as a sort of conclusion or con consequence of dehumanization of the of the work of art, in su such a point that I came to the idea of the ready-made. This is um, a ready-made bird cage. With, if you see me uh, having a hard time, because this is not sugar. This is marble, and it weighs a ton. And that was one of the elements that interested me when I made it, you see. It's already made and the sugar is changing to marble. It's a sort of mythological effect. His most famous one is a urinal. Uh, and so actually a few years ago, the American University Museum had a jury show uh, honoring Duchamp's 100th anniversary and you were supposed to bring in uh, ready-mates. And I had, uh, you couldn't doctor them in any way. Uh, I brought in, uh, I had uh, three party hats from a Parisian department store, and I mounted them on a styrofoam a plaque, and I called it Hats Off to Marcel. So that was in the uh, American University show. And I was very lucky because a friend knew Naomi Savage, whose Man Ray's niece, she lives in Princeton. And Man Ray and Duchamp were good friends and they exchanged uh, artwork. And so at Naomi Savage's house, I saw a couple of the Bois Valise. He's also famous for uh, a snow shovel that he called Prelude for a Broken Arm. And I used that as part of a piece when I was a student at the Corcoran. Uh, and he had uh, what he called a hat rack. Well, it was a hat rack, but he also had uh, Parisian bars had uh, place to put glasses to dry, which looks a lot like a hat rack also. And uh, I had a picture of him 
on the back of my hats off to Marcel. So also, Betty Saar, who I was very uh, touched with when I first saw her work about 30 years ago. Her mother was a seamstress, so I felt a kindred spirit. And she made assemblages and collage, and she now has two museum shows on either coast. There's also Louise Nevelson, who's uh, in a play at Theatre J. Uh, also, uh, the, only, the only other play about an artist is a play about Mark Rothko uh, that's called Red, and it's him talking to his assistant. So this, this is another theater piece. Also, I wanted to mention that Entezaka Shange, who about 30 years ago did a play called Colored Girls that was a big hit on Broadway. And at the Washington Women's Arts Center, we had uh, a lecture series, and she came to talk about it. Well, they have remounted her play on Broadway, and actually, she, she was born in 1948, but she died last year. So I wanted to mostly talk about how uh, the population is changing in the United States, and we now have fewer white people than people of other ethnic origins. So there are many books and TV shows that address this. But first, I forgot to do three things that I wanted to do when I talked about reminiscences. One is, when I talked about living in Rome in 1965 and renting an apartment that may have been owned, although it was modest, by a Contessa or Principessa, I would get phone calls uh, asking for the Principessa or the Contessa, and I would say, no, Che, she isn't here. Uh, and they, you know, who is this? And I'd say, uh, son, oh, Senora Snow. And then uh, when you spell out your name in Italy, you use Italian cities, and they ask, how do you spell it? And I'd say, Snow, Sicilia, Napoli, or Vieto. And since there are no cities beginning with W, I'd say Washington. And the other thing I forgot to talk about was on that first trip to Europe in 1950, looking for the cheapest way to travel, going home, we were leaving from England, and the British used p and O Canal, Pacific or Orient Canal, which was staffed by Goanese sailors, teenage Goanese sailors. So to save money, if you, when you took a bath, you took a salt water bath. And then it said, after your bath, bath press this button, which I did once because an 18 year old Goanese sailor came in and threw a bucket of fresh water over my head. So that was the end, end of that idea. So now on to how we are changing. And I'll start with uh, Upheaval. It's a book by Jared Diamond. And he looks at five countries and how they deal with a crisis. And I was surprised because Comparing Germany and Japan after the war, most people uh, don't choose Germany as the, the, the th way to behave. But he is right because in Germany, unlike showing Confederate flags here, because it is part of our history, in Germany, it's against the law to show any swastikas or Nazi flags. 
And in high school, they all learn about the Holocaust. And actually, if you go to the uh, concentration camps, uh, we were there when a busload of Italian high school students came. So that's all part of the curriculum for them to see a film about what happened here. Well, the Japanese I was impressed with because being the only people who experienced a, 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 an atom bomb, they have a peace museum in Hiroshima. Every school kid has to go through that, and I don't know if they still are able to do it, but they have survivors talk about what happens. And there's a big bell, and it says in English and Japanese, we want to live in peace with children all around the world. So I want to address how different cultures sometimes think it's good to assimilate and sometimes to keep their own culture. And a great example are the Japanese and the Chinese because a Chinese friend said to me, what good is a Chinese boy who doesn't know Chinese? So here in Potomac and many other places, there's Saturday school and they learn Chinese. The Japanese, on the contrary, think the important thing is to assimilate because so you'll get ahead that way. And actually, there's a saying in, in Japan, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. You're supposed to behave like everyone else. It's a homogeneous, it was a homogeneous society because it was an island in people who didn't really know anything about the West uh, until Admiral Perry came. I remember the first trip to Japan. I turned on TV and there was I Love Lucy in Japanese. Then there was a documentary about uh, Captain Kukawat, because that, that's how they pronounce Cook, because they have to have a consonant, a vowel on, on every part of their word. So that's a very different way to treat your, whether you're going to assimilate or keep your culture. And I think there is fear and, uh, about the other and changing, but we're a very, very country. And actually, since we still, still uh, just celebrated Thanksgiving, there was a spoof since actually the Indians helped keep the pilgrims alive. They showed them how to plant corn, and it was a spoof uh, showing po Pocahontas saying, we have to build a wall. Forget about showing them how to, how to plant corn and survive. But the early Americans kidnapped Native American children and place them in homes, Christian homes, to make them into Christians. Then there's the British and the French who think, well, the, here's a difference. The French thought you could make a black Frenchman. And so the kids in Cameroon and Senegal were using the same textbook so they could pass a test and get a federal job. But the British didn't think he could make a, a black Englishman. So they only know pidgin English. And they threw Gandhi off the train in his own country, India. And anyway, I have a lot of audio books I want to talk about. So I'll see you next time on the art scene. This is Lila Snow.